All right. Looks like we got people streaming in. So let's get this kicked off. Hey, everybody. I'm Alex Huang. I'm the Director of Programs and Community Engagement at APEX, which is the Asian Pacific American Institute for Congressional Studies. Just want to say welcome to today's latest in our webinar series on the appointment process. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, every presidential administration has approximately 4,000 non-career political positions across the entire federal government to fill. And so APEX working together with NCAPA, um, we are working to ensure that any administration has the widest pool of qualified, diverse public servants to choose from um, by identifying exceptional API candidates. And we also are bringing this webinar series to really help demystify the process of, number one, what is a political appointee? How do you get into that pipeline? What is the process? What is it really like? What do you need to prepare? What do you need to expect? All these great questions um, that we're really hoping to help demystify and answer for you all. Because um, you know, APIs are underrepresented in public service, especially at the federal level as political appointees. And so if you joined us last week, we had a fantastic panel conversation. We had four former um, API appointees talk about their experience navigating the process. Um, if you want to check out that conversation, it's uploaded on the Apex YouTube page. But today, uh, I'm really pleased to have here Candice Yu um, as our presenter. She's going to help give our audience a little bit of insight, including a brief presentation on Political Appointments 101, and we're going to open it up to Q&A after that. Uh, we don't have all the time in the world, and I know we had a lot of pre-submitted questions, but if you want to ask a question throughout as well, you should have access to the Q&A box if you're joining us on Zoom to put in questions through there. Uh, and so I'm not going to take up too much more time, but just want to say i um, really glad to have Candice here. Uh, as our presenter, she has a huge wealth of experience uh, across the government, um, and she's worked for, I believe, the transition in the PPO for Department of Defense, I believe, but um, I'm just going to let you take it from here, Candice. Sure. Thanks so much, Alex, and um, thanks to APAX and, and Kappa for having me. Um, I like to credit APAX as having helped me discover my passion for public service. I was an intern many, many years ago. <laughs> um, but it's always fun to come back and sort of recognize um, how I got into public service. So as Alex shared, my name is Candace Yu. I was an appointee during the Obama administration. I served uh, during the transition on the personnel team there, went on to the successor White House presidential personnel team, um, and then after a year moved over to the Department of Defense to um, go on to do some policy work in cybersecurity. Um, additional parts of my background, I worked on the Hill both in DC and in constituent services here in California. I'm based in California now. Um, and I'm just here today um, to, to speak a little bit about the process. So I'm gonna share some slides right here. So give me one second as I present. And um, a part of what I'm presenting today has been developed in partnership with some other phenomenal women who served in the Obama administration. Um, so as I bring this up, there we go. So we've sort of framed this as answering the call to service and really trying to get to know what political appointments 101 um, are and what to know about the process. As I mentioned, I've had the opportunity to partner with two other amazing phenomenal people um, on this, Eric Moritsuku, who um, I believe is on the call today, as well as Francie Yumberg. Um, they are both alongside um, me, alums of the Obama administration. We are what we call AAPI 44s, uh, Asian American Pacific Islander 44s. And we came together because we really wanted to impart um, sort of our insights and knowledge. Um, we're volunteers, we're not official spokespeople for transition, um, but we know that this can be a very mystifying process and we sort of just want to share our experience in an effort to ensure that the next administration is able to get off to a strong start, um, as well as ensure that the administration has um, the tools and the, the knowledge of their incredible diverse candidates out there and can ensure that the next generation of political appointees is reflective of um, the diversity in our country. So how are we going to go back or go through today's presentation? We're going to get a little bit of an overview about the, the process, what appointees are, where they go, who, um, how do you figure out what is an appointee, where they, what agency they're with, We'll talk about some key actions you can take if you are interested in applying and also identify some next steps. So who is a political appointee? Um, at the highest level, we're really talking about folks who are getting identified by 
uh, an incoming political administration. So in this case, President-elect Biden and uh, Vice President-elect Harris's teams to serve at the pleasure of that administration. Um, these roles that they will be chosen for, the appointees are typically term limited. Um, they often follow the amount of time that that office holder is in office, so a four year term. Um, if there's a subsequent term or a second election, successful election, that may become eight years. But typically when you get selected as appointment or appointee, you understand that it's really at will um, in service of that administration. Um, you're also serving in full-time or part-time capacity in rules across the country. We'll talk about, or I'll talk about where you might be able to find these roles and how you can figure out whether they're full-time, part-time, in DC, not in DC. As you're getting familiar with the process, you're also going to see a lot of acronyms. I know we have a, a range of experiences on today's call in terms of folks who know Washington DC well and folks who are new to thinking about the appointments process. So we're really gonna start from a level setting base of here are some acronyms you're, you may encounter. PAS, presidentially appointed and needing Senate confirmation are really some of the most senior level appointees who are selected by an administration. They include cabinet secretaries, um, they include other uh, ranks of Senate confirmed candidates, such as assistant secretaries, deputy secretaries. It can vary from department to department, but there is a band, if you will, of PAS candidates who all go before the Senate for confirmation. So there's a nomination process, a very lengthy vetting process that we'll talk a little bit more about, and then um, a Senate confirmation. Another type of appointee is a non-career SES. It really should be NC-SES, but you can also just say SES. Senior executive service is um, often reflective of someone who has um, management experience, maybe a senior advisor, may not be in a management role, but typically these are fairly senior roles. Um, they may be in the immediate circle of a cabinet secretary or a PAS candidate, um, but these are folks who typically are um, pretty seasoned in their subject matter area or in their function, if it's you know, comms or legal or what have you. And then the widest band is Schedule C. Um, it, during my time in the administration, I served as a Schedule C when I went to the Department of Defense. And as a Schedule C, um, a couple of things that it really notes is that it can be really broad ranging in terms of experience, professional experience. Um, Schedule Cs include um, folks who are really early in their careers, young professionals, it might be folks who are coming right off the campaign and want to continue working to advance um, the Biden administration's policy priorities. Um, and it could also be some senior folks too. If you want to get a sense of how broad that band is, is, you can really look at the federal pay scale, the general schedule, if you look at that. There's like a GS-15 that I think is the highest. Um, that range is reflective of how broad that experience and expertise may be. So Schedule C is another band of appointees that are a part of the political appointments world. Lastly, some other things to call out are regional administrators. Regional administrators are full-time appointees who, again, serve at the pleasure of the administration, um, are there for a certain amount of time, but they're not based in DC. There are definitely a handful, well, more than a handful, but a number of agencies that have roles outside of Washington, DC. So it could be um, housing and urban development, EPA, um, and we'll talk about where you can find out more about those and the resources you can use to do that. Boards and commissions are yet another area um, where you would find appointments. These appointments sometimes are full-time, sometimes they're part-time. So again, we'll talk about the resources in terms of how you can figure out what's what. Um, the interesting thing about boards and commissions is um, there is a board and commission probably for every single policy area or issue area you could possibly imagine. I remember um, one of the things that we thought was uh, amazing when we were at presidential personnel was, I think there were two, we were looking at two fishing commissions and for someone who doesn't fish, I, I don't 
know the distinctions between fish very well, but I remember there was one for a certain type of fish and one for a certain another type of fish, and it was really um, eye-opening to see that depending on what your expertise is, you might be a really great candidate for one of those commissions. Um, as I mentioned before, some are part-time, and that means you wouldn't necessarily need to leave where you are if you are outside of Washington, D.C., and um, in those roles, they might only meet occasionally. So really it is an advisory role. Um, it may not be paid, but it's another really incredible way to serve an administration and serve as a political appointee. Lastly, I mentioned the executive office of the president, um, just because it's a little bit, it operates a little bit differently than the rest of the agencies and political appointments. The EOP is really what you think of when you hear about the White House. Um, the White House itself is actually an organization within the EOP. You also have the National Security Council, you have the Council of Economic Advisors, you have the Office of Management and Budget, more acronyms. Um, but all of these entities or organizations are all under this umbrella of the Executive Office of the President. Um, appointments there follow a little bit of a different process, um, but usually it's similar folks are involved. So we'll talk about that in this one too. So our next slide. Is a political appointment right for you? And I think this is a really critical thought exercise as you're doing your research. Um, it sounds like table stakes and it really is that it's key to consider the lifestyle and financial impacts of serving in a political appointment. Um, when we were preparing this deck, I remember um, my colleague Francie had given me a really um, pointed story that made it, that really got the point across. And she said, she recalled an appointee who had left private sector, had joined the administration, was very excited to be serving, and had recently returned from a trip, um, a business trip, received a check, and their partner saw the check and thought, oh, great, um, your reimbursement check for travel has come back. And the appointee had to clarify that wasn't an actually the travel reimbursement check, it was the actual salary paycheck for the pay period. Um, and it's a sort of very illustrated way to say, public service truly is a commitment of, of to good. Um, and it can change lifestyles significantly, whether you have to move to DC, whether it's a change in salary. Um, and I think these are really key things to consider in understanding whether a political appointment is right for you. So lifestyle and financial impacts. Um, another thought exercise I really encourage candidates to consider are, where can you make the most impact that makes sense for you? You can make impact from outside the administration. You can make inside, uh, impact inside the administration. And sometimes one's a better fit based off of what your strengths are, what your interests are, what your timing is. So those are things that I think are really key in trying to make that assessment about whether a political appointment is right for you. Now to get a little bit more tactical and into the weeds in terms of resources, if you're familiar with the political appointment process, you might've heard about the Plum Book. The Plum Book is um, this rectangle that you see here on the screen, aptly named the Plum Book because of its color. Um, and what it does is it identifies all the appointees in, a gov in the government at a, as a snapshot in time. So the current Plum Book that's available is available from December, 2016. So when you look at that plum book, you'll see, okay, there's a cabinet secretary, the name, it will say PAS, and, and it will tell you who else is in that office. And it'll tell you if they're a Schedule C, a non-career SES, there may be some career folks as well in that office. But this plum book is really where you can start to identify and map out where are their political appointments across the government? And the Plum Book is incredible because if you wanna see how much breadth there is in terms of boards and commissions, it is your one-stop shop to determine that. It's also another great resource to determine where are these appointments? Are they in Washington? Are they outside Washington, in Virginia, Maryland? Or are they maybe in a different state? Um, these are all pieces of information that you can sort through or you can use, if you're looking at the PDF file, just search through very easily by looking through the Plum Book. Um, another thing that I recommend to candidates in determining whether or not a political appointment is right for them is following and getting information about the transition and this administration. Um, it goes almost without saying that political appointees 
are representatives on behalf of administration with a certain policy perspective, a certain point of view. So there's a bit of an assumption that they will um, agree and be able to best advocate for those views and positions. So know your stuff, follow transition at, 40, or at transition 46 on Twitter, familiarize yourself with what's on the transition website right now, buildbackbetter.com over time, knowing that you know appointments aren't all determined at one point in time. It can take a long time to get an appointment. You'll wanna continue following the White House webpage. You'll wanna continue following the um, specific agency websites that are most relevant to your area of interest or skill set. And lastly, um, talk to folks that you know, talk to your network. Um, I think another way that the Plum Book can be utilized is looking at who previously served in roles that you might be interested in and would they be willing to have an information, informational interview or informational chat with you about what it was like to serve? It's not gonna be necessarily um, the perfect answer because you won't know who's working there today or how it's changed, but it's a really interesting, um, really great source of information to understand is that really what you think the role is? Because one role named special assistant at one agency may mean something else at another agency. So what is the process? Um, and I'll note, having come from DC, my style of slides has changed. Um, I love to add a little bit of uh, humor because I know this process can feel um, not that intuitive. And in fact, it is not the same for any candidate across, like, I, you know, I can say um, one person who served in the administration and another, neither are going to have the same journey in terms of how they got their appointment. So it really can feel a little bit like you're trying to figure out who's the, the Wizard of Oz. Um, there are some key components that are similar, though. So we'll talk about those components and how they factor in. Resume and qualifications, it's just, you know, sort of the coin of the realm to be able to articulate and give your best case of who you are, what your skill set is, and why you're qualified and interested in serving in the administration. So typically, that's going to be the key thing that helps you articulate, you know, to whomever you're um, discussing your interest with, why you should be considered and why they should, you know, have a, a follow-up conversation or what have you. Um, I do distinguish this from cover letters. I know there's been a lot of questions about um, are cover letters helpful? My personal opinion um, is if you have time to do it, that's great. Um, but certainly the resume, I think, is the key surface where you want to elevate and highlight and make the best case for yourself as a candidate. So once you have your resume out there and you are stating your interest, hopefully you made a candidate slate. So wherever um, the appointment is happening, typically when candidates are identified as um, folks that should be interviewed or explored further, they, their name will be added to a candidate slate. So that's typically what happens in the process. I would say it's unusual um, unless it's, you know, there's no question, there's no other candidates we're looking for. It's such a specialized area. This is the, you're the only name on the candidate slate, um, but you want to sort of figure out how do I get my name on the candidate slate? How do I advocate for and ask my, you know, um, validators, if you will, how to get my name onto a candidate slate? Interviews. Um, a common question I get is how long does the process take? How many interviews are there? Um, to reiterate, no process is the same. Some interviews will be one, some interview processes will be two, and some may be many, many months. And it can depend not only on the seniority and the amount of vetting that goes into the role, um, but can also honestly just reflect that it is a political process. There are many folks who may be um, stakeholders too and have the opportunity to provide input on who the right um, hire will be. So don't take it personally. Um, sometimes you have to interview multiple times before you can potentially land the role. Um, vetting is yet another uh, significant part of the process. Regardless of whether you are um, you know, someone who's really early in your career and you're gonna be a Schedule C or you're going to be a cabinet secretary, everybody gets vetted. Um, vetting looks different from one administration to the next. Um, it's some common stuff in terms of, you know, there might be 
a look at your LinkedIn profile, it might be a look at a Google search, but this formal components of vetting will include a lot of forms. And so just to get your, uh, give you a sense of um, what those forms include, and if you want to get yourself sort of ahead of the game, these are things you could do. You could take a look at what goes into a background investigation, anticipate, you know, making sure you have the addresses for where you've lived over the past 10 years. Um, recognize that that can feel invasive to some, and sometimes that's not right for all, um, but that is a part of the process. There's a background investigation and the degree to which that investigation goes really does uh, ramp up as there's more uh, consideration and more um, complexity to the role. The OGE 278, to add to your acronyms, um, is the Office of Government Ethics Financial Disclosure Forms. And this is really to identify, do you have conflicts of interest? If you were going to serve in a role um, that had influence over a certain policy area or industry, um, do you have investments there? Is there a reason why you know, the government or you should make a disclosure or state your um, position so that you can be clear what you are allowed or not allowed to do or what you might have to do to be in order to take the appointment if you want to pursue it. For national security roles and class of, um, roles involving classified information, there's the SF-86 for security clearances. Um, as someone who's gone through that process, um, we're talking about trying to identify where have you been outside of the US for the past seven, 10 years? Uh, who are the foreign nationals that you've come in contact with? Um, can you identify individuals at every single place that you've lived who can attest to your residency there? So, you know, at the time that I went through it, I had to identify someone in grad school, I had to identify someone in college. Um, that is the length to which some of the vetting is required. And yet another level, um, is Senate committee questionnaires. So for all the Senate presidentially appointed and Senate confirmed candidates, the PAS candidates, um, they have a whole nother level of questions that they can anticipate from the Hill or Capitol Hill. So who can advance your candidacy? This slide is really aimed to identify who are the stakeholders in the process? And then we'll talk about how that process sort of intermingles. Um, you know, I could go linear, linearly um, in terms of who these stakeholders are, but they definitely, there's a lot of information flow amongst all of these entities. So um, we'll get to that towards the end of the slide. White House presidential personnel um, in many ways functions as an executive search agency, um, you know, Right now, they exist in transition as the personnel team. Um, they will have a successor in the White House. So if you've applied to build back better um, or handed over your resume to the transition team, PPO would take that database and be able to continue searching it over the next four years to fill roles in the administration. They're gonna look at um, and do searches for candidates that really bring, and you know, this, this administration has stated their commitment to um, diversity, and so um, regionally, ethnically, um, in many different ways. So PPO is, a, is certainly a key part or nerve center to the appointment process. Often what's happening is they are coming up with candidate slates, they develop candidate slates, and they may share that over with another entity called the White House liaisons. These are individuals who um, are sitting at another agency, so they're sitting at um, labor or they're sitting at state, um, you name the department, and they are the key person to help facilitate communications with the White House in personnel pro the personnel process. So PPO may send a candidate slate over to the White House liaisons, liaisons who are really close to the ground and know um, the key players in the agency can help navigate, okay, how do we get that candidate slate to the hiring manager? Um, we have feedback from the hiring manager that we need to take back and send back to PPO to say like, look, they want someone who has more experience in this area or maybe someone who has this kind of expertise. Um, so there's a lot of movement and conversation that happens there. Liaisons themselves may help develop that slate in terms of sourcing. They may be a point where, um, a source point where you, can get your resume to and they can help get um, resumes and names onto candidate slates. So PPO and the liaisons work very, very closely together. Um, but just the key difference is 
The PPO team sits at the White House. The liaisons are a key representative on behalf of their agency that liaises with PPO. You also have other stakeholders like advocates and congressional members who are quite influential and can be helpful um, to advance your candidacy, candidacy in the process. Advocates may include um, folks like APEX and NCAPA who are hosting resume banks and really asking um, talent to identify themselves so that they can help advocate for um, greater representation and great expertise in the new administration. Um, it may also be by issue area. You may find that if you were in um, your environmental scientist, maybe there's an association or um, a group that's really trying to get a resume bank of folks with that expertise, and they're going to be advocating to PPO, to the liaisons, to the agencies. Here are candidates that we know would represent um, the, this area of policy really well. Um, so they can be really helpful in getting your resume to the liaisons, getting your resume to PPO, and just really getting your name up there to build your candidacy. I want to note here, as I'm talking about build your candidacy, um, not every role requires such a campaign, if you will, but getting a job in the administration is, is a, is a, um, is work, it, it, it takes some hustle. So that's why, you know, I think it's really key just to understand all the different parts that are involved in getting someone through to an appointment. Um, congressional members also can be very influential. Um, it is not uncommon for congressional members to identify candidates from their district. They take great pride in having their districts represented. Um, in the administration and it doesn't just have to be congressional members they may be governors they may be uh, mayors um, so they can be state and locally elected officials but they're all again individuals who may be able to lend um, a certain expertise a certain relationship to help get your name or resume um, a, a, an additional look if you will um, I think on that note about congressional, sometimes when I bring that up, there's I get a lot of questions about, well, I don't know anybody in Congress. That's okay. You still live in a district that's represented by someone in Congress. They are your member. Um, for many members, they would love nothing more than to ensure that there's a lot of representation from their district in the administration. So don't be shy. You can certainly reach out to your locally elected official and ask them, hey, would you be willing to send my resume onto PPO, liaison, et cetera. And lastly, and not least, you are your best advocate. You know yourself the best. Um, you are the best representative of who the administration could gain as a, a teammate. So um, don't sell yourself short. Definitely consider all the things that you can be doing to be proactive about um, advancing your candidacy through the process. Do's and don'ts. Um, be patient and prepared to wait. As I mentioned, um, it can take a long time and maybe it's a, a couple of rounds of interviews, but sometimes it's not even just rounds of interviews. We're talking about the reality that there are a lot of open roles. There's going to be the most number of open roles that the administration will have at the start of it. That also means it has the most intense um, interest right now. Um, and that can feel overwhelming. It can feel like it's highly competitive and it is. Um, but if you really are interested, if you're open to it, you can get a role two years in. Um, I wouldn't leave your job to you know, just assume you're gonna get an appointment, um, but be patient and prepared to wait. Sort of you know, make your case, continue to update folks that you know um, who might be uh, connected in the process, who might be able to um, offer some advice. Um, and continue to state your interest in why you want to serve in the administration. That really connects to, you know, keeping your network updated. Um, a point that I know um, Erica uh, Mortsugu had made on a, a call recently that I had was, um, you can arm your validators, you can um, make your, the folks who are, you know, advocating for you um, really well informed by keeping them Update it by what you're interested in, what you're hearing, what research you're doing. So um, don't be shy about that. Be open-minded and flexible about roles. I think a, a key example here is 
often for folks who might want to do foreign policy, they think ex that maybe it's just State Department and maybe it's just the Department of Defense or USAID. Um, in fact, many of the traditional domestic agencies, um, whether it's health and human services or labor or commerce, have offices, have departments where they are making international policy. And it could be a really interesting way to um, get into foreign policy. And that's where you use the plum book. You can use the plum book and look at, okay, in the commerce department section, let's look for international, let's look for uh, international telecommunications or other offices that might carry that over. And then you can sort of begin to map it out to see, okay, what does the website for their agency say? What kind of work do they do? And that's really how you start to create that open-mindedness and that flexibility about where you might be able to serve if you, if you feel so moved. Um, I've sort of said this ad nauseum to self-advocate um, that you really are your best advocate, um, but it goes without saying, don't be that candidate. Having worked at PPO, um, I just really want to encourage you not to be the person who's remembered for the wrong reasons. Don't bribe folks, that shouldn't be a, a question. Um, don't call them every single day to ask, you know, is my name on a candidate slate? Um, you really want to be intentional. You want to be authentic and representative of who you are as a candidate. Um, and you want to come across as the best that you can be in terms of why, you know, they should continue to bring your resume up to agencies and what have you. So those are some of the do's and don'ts. Lastly, uh, the next steps. What can you expect after applying? Candidates are being reviewed on a rolling basis. Um, this is, again, the sort of reality that if you've entered your resume into uh, buildbackbetter.com, that resume will be forwarded to the White House uh, and the Presidential Personnel Office. They will have access to be able to search it and share it with White House liaisons. Um, and that's not just for the next six months, that is for the next four years. So that statement of interest is there and will be accessible. Because of the sheer interest um, and volume of candidates, I know the reality is candidates will not hear back unless um, they are identified as potential matches, um, folks who might make the candidate slates, folks who might be identified for potential interviews. Um, and lastly, again, transition will hand it over to the White House, so there's no need to apply again. Um, I know in the time that the transition site has been up, some folks have identified questions about, well, you know, I've had some other thoughts about where I would be willing to serve, what my interests are, or maybe I, I want to change my resume. Um, the general thought here is, I would say, unless it's a real significant deviation from what you've provided, I'd give it some time in terms of updating your resume. Um, I think from a, a standpoint of um, just database management, I, I think the transition is uh, welcoming of all applications, but um, to the extent that they can minimize duplicates or triplicates or what have you, um, they, they are eager to sort of keep it as organized as possible. Um, the Plum Book, it's uh, free and readily accessible um, via GSA or the General Services Administration, so you can find it online. And lastly, I'd like to point folks to the Partnership for Public Service. It's another organization in Washington, D.C. They do a tremendous job of looking at the historical um, processes of transition and administrations coming into governing. Um, so their Center for Presidential Transition uh, has a ton of information about the political appointments process that um, can provide a much uh, sort of a 102, if you will, on appointments. So with that, I'm gonna toss it back to Alex and we can go ahead and go for questions and answers. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Candice. Um, and, and I know we have a few questions coming in. Feel free to keep on submitting them to the Q&A. I did want to follow up because uh, one of the questions was, where do we send our resumes? Um, so thanks for talking about Build Back Better, uh, Candice. And as well for our audience, too, wanted to mention that part of this appointment project that APAX is trying to do to diversify the pipeline of API appointees is that we do have a resume bank with Incapa, our partner um, that we've created. So I think it looks like Hyejin has dropped it in the chat. She has, fantastic. So uh, if you follow that link, um, that is also another route. That's another resume bank that we have set up that I recommend that people put their information into if they're interested. All right, 
Um, and the other thing too is, yes, the Center for Presidential Transition, Ready to Serve. It's a fantastic resource. Um, as Candace was alluding to, they also have great tools on there. There's even a self-assessment tool to kind of figure out and ask yourself these important questions. You know, am I a right fit? Is this a right fit for me? Where do I want to serve? At what level? So I recommend everybody check out all those tools that are available as well. So why don't we get into the questions though? Uh, and let's start with um, going back to what you said, one, you know, the most important thing is your resume. We've gotten a few different questions about the resume. So what advice do you have, Candice, about, let's say like the structure of it, how long maybe should it be? How do you elevate and know what to elevate in terms of your experiences to highlight to make yourself stand out? Yeah, I also see that there's a question here about the USA job style or two pager. Um, I think my instinct, and I don't think there's a there's a right answer here, is just common sense, right? So if we think about the process of how resumes are um, sort of transferred and shared between the, the folks who would see resumes, whether they're in PPO, the liaisons, a cabinet secretary, an assistant secretary, or whomever is hiring a deputy assistant secretary, um, when they get that resume, they're going to first look at that first page, right? So let's just think about that real estate. Where are you emphasizing your core strengths and who you are? Is that really expressed up top on that first page? Um, I don't think that format is, um, knock on wood, I hope folks aren't super dogmatic about format for resumes. And I think it really is key and strategic to think about what do you um, make the case for up front? So you know, if you are a lawyer or an attorney and you are looking for a legal position, then maybe you're gonna really put that up front, right? You don't want them to wait till the second page to find out, oh, they went to law school and they are you know, admitted to the DC bar. Um, you somehow wanna like reference that. So maybe it's a summary. It might be a key summary or sort of executive summary at the top of who you are. So I think it's common sense in terms of really trying to tailor it to who you think you are as a candidate and recognizing that this is a unique process in your that you're not, applying for a specific job description, the way you can tailor it and really sort of anticipate, okay, this is this is how I would fit into this role. Um, this is where you're really gonna be creative about saying, okay, this is the breadth of what I am as a candidate. Uh, maybe I have core communication skills or I have management skills. How large are the teams that I've managed? What is the budget that I've had control over? Um, I think these are the, some of the things that I would consider in terms of that form is to really highlight upfront um, and really consider you're making your best case on that first page. Um, feel free to definitely include a second page. I think um, three is starting to get to a place where you might not get your third page looked at. Um, so this is less CV, more resume. Um, but I'll also add, it can depend, right? Honestly, if you were a candidate for the Surgeon General or you were in another role that had a lot of publications, I would understand why you would have a, a, something closer to a, a CV that's much longer. Um, so common sense applies there, but um, again, make your best case on that first page and sort of that prime real estate. Awesome. Uh, and then we actually had, I think, a couple of similar questions about references, letters of recommendation too. Um, Cause you know, you mentioned having maybe an elected official advocate for you. What about our folks who maybe don't have um, you know, an elected official, who can we go to and who should people really look for to um, be the references and recommenders? Yeah, I, I mean, let me just first state that you do not have to have a recommendation letter to be able to get an appointment. Um, I sort of identified those stakeholders as folks who can be influential in the process. You have access to them. And I would argue everyone has access to a, a member of Congress because you're a constituent. Um, but um, those letters should be going to uh, the Presidential Personnel Office. I know that the transition team has named the head of the uh, personnel team. I believe her name is uh, Kathy Russell, um, but do your research, make sure you know where you're, you have your references going. Um, same thing with liaisons. I think it will take a little bit while, a while longer to know and actually even to find out who the White House liaisons may be at um, the various agencies. Mm -hmm. and. I would anticipate that um, the presidential personnel office will have leads for different areas. So you'll have the head of presidential personnel and then you'll have folks who are leading, um, you know, the search for uh, appointees in health, education, labor, 
um, and then you'll have someone doing the national security search so that they're trying to really marshal their expertise in, in a key area. So those folks will then become uh, additional key references or points of contact uh, in the process. So for now, um, go with the information you know. If you know that the uh, transition has identified the incoming White House Presidential Personnel Director, uh, if you want to address it or send your uh, recommenders or your references in a direction, that's where I would go. And I'm glad you touched on that too, because um, like you mentioned that this is not, you know, obviously it's it's the hot topic now, but this is meant to last and, you know, continue on for the, at least, you know, first four years of this administration. And that's kind of what these banks are for too. Things take time uh, and information changes quickly. Um, some information can be outdated soon. And, you know, as people get hired and people move around in different positions, um, you know, just, you need to do your research. You need to kind of stay up to date on what the latest is. So, absolutely, yeah, um, let's see. So another good question that we have is kind of about um, looking through these banks, you're asked to select really what you're interested in, uh, what agency, um, I'm trying to combine a few questions here, but let's say um, I see one from Anoop that the application asks you to specify what department agency position you might be you know, most interested in. When you're doing this, how specific do you need to get? And would you be pigeonholing yourself um, you know, by specifying specific offices or should you go more broad? And yeah, then I don't know. Not I didn't know if you want to connect it to because we've had some people ask like should I have you know list first second third choices of like unrelated agencies or should I try to keep it more cohesive what are your recommendations for those types of people looking for an appointment um I think for the majority of candidates flexibility is good so I think that you know if you're considering doing a summary on your resume at the top to say like what you're interested in or what your skill sets you might identify some of the agencies or issue areas you're you're most interested in or you have the most you can make the most impact. Um, I think as it relates to the application, um, you know, I'm taking a best guess here. We had a different setup. We had a similar application portal um, in 2008 and 2009, um, but certainly times have changed. And um, I'm sure that the new application is much more um, savvy than what we had. And my best guess is, you know, click on what you really are willing to consider. Um, don't click everything just for the sake of, you know, being able to cast the broadest net. But if you are um, willing cons to consider an agency, you know, you've done your research, you know what kind of rules those are, um, that's that's a good reason to go ahead and say, yes, I would be interested. Um, whether you include, you know, your top three agencies, to me, um, in my personal opinion, I think agencies can be helpful if you have a very specific um, maybe a narrow expertise if you are, again, like the Surgeon General or an MD. Um, but if you have a skill set that might be uh, more like a utility player and you could play in a number of different agencies, maybe you're comms, you're a communications person, and um, you could, you know, maybe you have an, an uh, expertise in agricultural affairs, but maybe you would be also great in interior. Um, that's where I would say it's helpful to be able to say you have skills that are applicable to issue areas because it gives a little bit more room. Um, but if you really are like, you only want to determine to say, I will only serve these agencies, then be upfront, be transparent about what you're interested in. Awesome. Uh, and then let's try to go through all these questions here. Um, we have one from Tanya about what kinds of things, what kinds of questions should we expect to be asked during the interview process? It's really going to vary. <laughs> Which is, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think for 4,000 different roles, it's going to be yeah. varied on how senior is the role, um, what is the purpose of the role. Um, I think something that is underestimated in political appointments is just knowing that you are only serving for a short period of time. This is not a this is not a, a long term career, if you will. Um, and knowing that you are committed and you're aware of that, and that you're going to be a great team player, I think is honestly it's a fit. Um, I think that's really key to a lot of folks who are hiring, is that if you're doing long hours, if you know you you have you know a time limited um, mission, uh, just knowing that you know you come to the table as someone who's ready to ready to go, I think is a really key thing to highlight in those interviews. Awesome. 
Um, we've got a couple questions on the security clearance. Mm -hmm. um, first one is, uh, does already having a clearance help your chances? Um, I don't think it hurts. Um, but I also don't think, um, I know I see a couple of the national security questions and the SF-86 questions. Um, yeah. I don't think that it, it, you know, having one now hurts. Um, certainly it's a lengthy process and there's always a backlog at the start of an administration because there's so many people that they're trying to get through um, to have their cases reviewed. And you know, there's this sort of constantly evolving prioritization of like, okay, we've got a Senate confirmed person who has to get theirs and what have you. Um, so I think having one doesn't hurt. Um, I don't think it necessarily makes you, puts you ahead of the line. Um, I think it makes you a competitive candidate. I think that if you've been through the security clearance process, um, honestly, you get a gold star because you know how to navigate that process. You know how lengthy it is. You know what information you have to keep track of and document in order to maintain a clearance and to keep that um, active. Awesome. All right. Um, and then I think, let's see. The second, I see the one on the SF-86 that says, can you address duplication of effort? For example, you have a security clearance, why complete another SF-86? Yeah, I definitely, am, I'm not advocating for completing another. I'm just saying that um, it, it's entirely possible there may be additional questions that they wanna update you and who knows if you they need to get you a different compartment level. Um, so there are, it, it's not go ahead and fill it out as much as like, just be ready and sort of be aware of the information you may need to have on hand um, to keep the process going. Because I think as a candidate, um, if you're identified in the process, you wanna keep the ball moving, right? So every time the ball comes back to you, you wanna be able to toss it back to them as quickly as possible. So doing your research ahead of time um, just enables you to be a little bit quicker and have a quick, uh, faster step in the process. Okay. Um, I'm going to switch gears now. Uh, I've got a couple of questions, um, maybe for the early career age uh, folks who might be interested in an appointment. Uh, first one is kind of what type of questions did you ask yourself when you were determining whether or not um, to be a political appointee, uh, if that was the right professional career for you? And then just general advice for college students graduating in May who might be interested in an appointment. Yeah, um, I might need your help. Yeah. <laughs> So I, let me answer the, the question about if you're graduating soon. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's really key for folks who are graduating soon um, to cast a wide net. If you are interested in serving in, a, in an appointment, um, recognizing it can take a long time to get an appointment, that are, there's so much interest, think about also applying for roles that can help you get to that appointment. Um, being, being in DC, getting into the issue area that you might be interested in working in further or exploring in your early career. Um, honestly, Hill experience never hurts um, just because you get to know sort of that process, that world. Um, I think these are key places where you also wanna be considering other roles and jobs that enable you to increase and enhance your ability to advocate for yourself as a candidate for an appointment. Um, I think a part of the reality for um, some of the more junior roles or folks who are early in their career is that um, there are likely a lot of candidates coming from the Biden campaign who want to remain um, in or who want to join the administration. And um, because they already know the organization, they have they also have a network of folks who might be joining the administration. Um, they're going to also be uh, candidates. And so knowing what access they have and who they know, um, I would anticipate that those folks will also likely be um, very, very strong candidates for some of the uh, roles who don't have a lot of uh, years of experience in um, their jobs. So I think keeping an open mind, thinking about what roles can help you land that administration, that's not our administration role. It's not just about sort of in the next six months or thinking that as soon as I graduate, I'm gonna step right into a, a role in the administration. So thinking about, okay, in a year, in 18 months, if there's a role change, how can I best position myself to be a great candidate for it? Okay, and then um, I'm gonna circle back to that first one, which I think applies not just necessarily to recent grads is what are the types of questions that you asked yourself when you were determining whether or not a political pointy was the right move for you? Um, it's interesting because I got, so my personal story, um, um, sort of public service is 
I started interning in high school. I knew very early on or sort of discovered early on that I really loved um, public service and the opportunity to connect with people and do something that felt like it was having a, a greater impact. Um, I think the political appointment aspect came into play for me in a way that um, in some ways rubbed against uh, a conversation I would have with my, my family often about, you know, if you're serving at the pleasure of an elected official, you don't exactly get to chart your own course in terms of how long you're going to hold that job. If they lose an, if they lose an election, you have no guarantee that you will continue to hold your job. And I think knowing that um, and being aware of that, I was really um, keen on making sure I knew what skill sets I wanted to develop. What, what did I want to achieve? Like this really does sort of fit into a narrative of what, how do you want to develop um, in your professional career? Or, you know, how does it fit in your lifestyle? So I think those are sort of some of the things that you could probably consider um, in terms of trying to make that call, of whether you want to pursue a political appointment. I know I've encountered a lot of folks who have asked um, if they're currently in career civil service, um, do they make the jump and how can they go back to career civil service? Um, you know, I think my opinion or my thoughts there is um, it happens. There, it, there are definitely cases of folks who are career civil service employees in the federal government who become political appointees and then um, they may try to return to career civil service, but I don't think it's that typical. And sometimes I think it's discouraged. Um, in fact, I would say there's a, a term that is not well um, uh, loved called burrowing where um, political appointees um, are discouraged from staying in government beyond their term because the, the thought is, well, your term is up. Now it's, if, you, if, you know, if you're president or your elected official is no longer there, it's now the opportunity for this next incoming administration to serve. All right, thanks. And I think I'm glad you touched on that because we've had a few questions about career, political, going back and forth on there. Um, and one that I do want to touch on, because I know we've gotten this in our previous webinars and people have emailed in, it's a very frequently asked question are, what do you anticipate the most competitive agencies will be? Hmm. Um, I think sometimes um, the ones that I, I feel like come to mind right off, right off the bat are state and defense, but that's also because they're like these big agencies and they do a lot of different things. And so there's a, a, almost a clear perception of what they do. Um, so it's not necessarily because it's the work that they're doing. Um, it's just that they have better name recognition or brand recognition. Um, so I would say those agencies often come up, especially you know, as someone who worked at defense um, and uh, for a while working foreign policy, you know, that was very natural, um, that state and Department of Defense would come up. But it was really incredible to see um, the trade-offs I could have made had I decided to work at a different agency that was doing foreign policy work. Because whereas everyone was doing foreign policy in the agency I ended up in, I could have been a very like senior specialist at another agency. And so those are some of the trade-offs um, that you can consider and having that open-mindedness and flexibility to where you might want to serve. But I think, you know, I, I think it's really depends. Um, I think it's all competitive, to be honest. I don't think there's an agency that isn't competitive. Um, if it isn't competitive, I think it's because it takes a really, really like um, narrow area of expertise where there's not a lot of folks that are experts in that area. Um, and maybe that's the only reason it's not competitive. But I think, you know, depending on wherever you would like to serve, I'm, I would be confident that there's a lot of great talent. Um, and that's the wonderful thing for the administration is that they have an incredible um, wealth of talent and hopefully will select one that's diverse in terms of who's representing the, the administration. I agree. Um, I know we've been asking and pushing um, publicly and all over the place, us and a lot of partner orgs to ensure that that's upheld. Uh, okay, let's try to get in because I know we're coming up on the hour and we have a ton of questions, but let's try to sneak in a couple last ones. Um, we have one that says, it uh, seems like many of the roles are very senior or for recent grads. Do you think people with 10 to 12 years of experience um, are suitable for roles? Absolutely. Um, I think it's almost easiest to describe those two ends in terms of that process, that um, there is a lot of flexibility to um, joining at a mid-career stage um, 
it really depends. It, I think what's harder about identifying those opportunities is it might be more personality dependent. It might depend who the hiring manager is, who the secretary is, who the uh, deputy assistant secretary is, what have you, to determine how much experience they're looking for um, in that role. So I would not discourage it. Um, I think it's just more dependent on personalities versus like, is there an office that does that area of policy? Hmm. So a lot of the, you know, what we've been encouraging people to do is just do your research, stay up to date, make sure you're, you know, not just referencing the plum books of the past two, but keeping up to date on, you know, what is the current administration, the incoming administration, you know, what are their plans for that certain agency, that bureau um, coming mm -hmm. ahead. So one that, uh, where did it go? There it is. Um, one that I think people um, have also expressed an interest in is kind of long-term planning um, and people's careers and how an appointment fits into that. And so um, if you want to share a little bit about like what do political appointees and you yourself included, what have they gone on to do and what did you go on to do after the yeah. administration? Um, I think depending on what your career goals are, you know, it can be any, you are your own storyteller. You get to sort of build your own narrative about how this fits into whatever tale you're making. Um, for folks who, you know, know that they love being in DC and whether or not um, the current administration represents their policy views, they just want to be in DC because they want to affect policy and, cha you know, change policy, what have you. Um, you know, I think you can look at Nira Tandon, who just got nominated for uh, the Office of Management and Budget. If you look at her career, I mean, I think this is actually a great example. Look at individuals who are getting nominated. Look at what their careers have been. Nira served in Secretary Clinton's Senate office. Um, then she was serving in Senator Obama, uh, President Obama's administration, doing health care. She went to HHS. And then she she's been heading up uh, the Center for American Progress. So she was at a think tank. So she's kept in the policy realm in different capacities, both on Capitol Hill, executive agency. Um, there are others who have done a private sector route. For me, I've come back to California and I'm now in the private sector and very happily back home in, in San Francisco. Um, so I think it really depends on sort of what your life goals are and um, what fits for you. Awesome. Um, I know we have a ton of questions, uh, but which is why we're having this series too. And if we didn't get to it, especially with our frequently asked questions, um, Apex and Capo, you know, we're really trying to uh, make sure we collect all of these so we have all of your questions saved and we're going to try to come out with you know a frequently asked question um, kind of a post so people can have most of the FAQs answered but also if you take a look at those other resources that Candace has shared as well too um, from both the Center for Presidential Transition and going to buildbackbetter.gov uh, a lot of good information is out there um, if you do your research so as we close it out Candace are there any last parting words advice top line level information you want to impart on our audience um, thank you for being interested in serving. Um, I think that it's a really tough time um, for um, public service. And I think that if you are willing to serve, um, try it out. Um, we certainly need more great public servants and it doesn't have to just be at the administration level. Um, if you know that you're sort of maybe try to plan out how you might pursue an appointment over a year's time, Think about how you might become active locally in that area, how you might be able to serve um, nearby if you don't live in DC. Um, I think there are many ways that you can actually help an incoming administration if that's your vision, um, if you're sort of aligned with that pol policy vision and you can still do it without being a, a political appointee. Like that doesn't make or break um, your ability to, to sort of ensure that this administration is successful. So um, that's sort of my, my closing thought is to not be defined by whether or not um, you get an appointment. It is a pr process that should not be taken personally. It is, you know, it, it's, <laughs> it is what it is. Uh, yeah. And you do your best, just do your best to know that like you are your best advocate and no one can take that away from you. Yeah. Um... I think you really hit on a theme that we talked about last week in our previous webinar too, that I think it was uh, Grace Choi who, who mentioned PNP, prayer and persistence um, and not taking it personally. It is a complicated, convoluted process. Um, that's why you know we're having this series, uh, really just trying to open it up for, you know, especially APIs to really understand, you know, what is an appointment? How do I get in that pipeline? Uh, so I just really wanna say just a huge thank you to you Candice for giving some of your time tonight to share a little bit with our audience as well. Um, and 
as I think we dropped all the links into the chat too. But as Candace mentioned, another way to get into that, you know, to get your resume flagged, et cetera, is through the different advocacy groups. So Apex and Incapa, we have our resume bank as well too. So make sure you check that out and get your information in there. That's gonna be live and running for, um, for a while. Um, but just wanna say thank you so much, Candace, for making the time tonight. Thank you to our partners in Kappa. If you are interested as well too, we have another webinar coming up on Tuesday night um, in conjunction with Latinas represent um, specifically focusing on the perspectives from Latina and API women on their experiences in the appointment process. So join us, um, I looks like Heejin threw the link in the chat too if you wanna register for that as well um, for more information. But thanks to everybody who hopped on tonight to join us um, and hope to see you guys soon. Thank you.